Hi, I'm Ryan Stauffer. I'm the founder and CEO of a startup called Inharmonic. What we're trying to do is make it easy for decision makers to interact with their data. So what I'll be talking about is how you can deploy a really powerful graph data system on top of the Scylla cluster you already have. And basically that looks like Janus Graph, Elasticsearch, and Scylla. And we'll use the power and flexibility of Kubernetes to deploy Janus Graph and Elasticsearch, and you'll be able to use the existing Scylla cluster you're, you're already running. So, you know, hopefully this is a, a nice and interesting presentation for you. Hope you enjoy the video. Um, you know, real quick, my name is Ryan Stauffer. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Inharmonic. Um, I first got interested in graph databases a few years back when I was basically trying to solve the issue of how to build a consoli consolidated data model of automotive aftermarket data and using data as it kind of lived within some business verticals we owned um, was very difficult. We were dealing with like hundreds of tables and you know billions of rows and columns and the path from that to insights in this model were, were really bad. Um, whereas on the other hand, if we took like a graph model of the data, uh, it made things a lot more straightforward. And so since then I've viewed uh, a graph data model and a graph data system as really the core of how you build a solution for a business so they can ask and answer better questions about their business. Um, and you know, what do we do about in what do we do at Inharmonic? Uh, so fundamentally, fundamentally we're trying to solve the issue of how decision makers can easily interact with data. Um, a lot of people don't really care about like where data lives. They really care about how they're able to interact with it, how their developers and their data scientists and their non-technical users can get access to this data. So our approach is to provide a nice visual interface and allow people to use you know, free text search and uh, just you know, point, click, and drag operations to explore their data as these logical business concepts. Um, and then after that, the system will recommend some nice analyses that make sense. Um, all of that, of course, needs to be powered by a ton of automation on the back end, and beneath all of that is a, is a graph database, and really more precisely, a graph data system. Um, so, like, what is a graph data system? Um, you know, Brian hit this at a high level, but, you know, fundamentally we can break that into two big pieces. We have graph and we have a data system. And so by graph, all we mean is that our data is modeled as a property graph. We have vertices, edges, and properties. Vertices tend to model entities, like a product or a customer. Uh, an edge models the relationship between two entities, like a customer knowing another customer. And then a property just models an attribute, so the name and age of a particular customer. And then that data system piece just means that we have multiple distinct components that when combined together give us a single logical system we can interact, interact with. And so you know, there's a lot of databases out there on the market. When we want this combination of like flexibility, performance, and scalability, uh, this is a really good data system. And so it's basically three parts. In the center, we have Janus Graph, which is a Java application that clients are going to interact with directly. And it doesn't really store any data directly itself. What it does is rely on a uh, storage backend, in this case, Scylla, which is a fantastic storage backend, and Elasticsearch for some more advanced indexing capabilities. So you know, this is all great in theory, but what are the advantages of a data system like this? So I think there's three that really top our mind. Um, and so the first is flexibility, and then schema support, and then the support for both transactional and analytical workloads. Um, and then just a, a brief aside, the transactional and analytical workloads here don't really have anything to do with the uh, Scylla workload prioritization. That's like a fantastic Scylla feature, but it's at a much lower level. Everything I'm discussing is at the higher graph level. So flexibility. To me, that's the killer feature of why you would use a graph in the first place. Um, you know, business logic changes, application requirements change. All that stuff is really difficult to manage if you're just using a traditional database, um, especially like a relational database. So if you use a graph data model, though, it's much easier to kind of add new vertices, add new edges, and that allows you to model the changing nature of your requirements over time. And you also don't have to throw out everything that works already. Um, you can write analytics results directly back into your primary data store and explicitly link it to your source data. And what that gives you is a really cool way that teams can share insights. Uh, you also get powerful data provenance capabilities right in your main database. 
Uh, to me, schema support is like a very nice to have thing when it comes to a database. What that fundamentally allows you to do, right, is separate out these you know, data integrity issues from your application business logic. Uh, so some graph databases don't really support schema support out of the box. Janus Graph does, and it's very flexible. So it means that we can say that, for instance, I would like a product vertex to be allowed to have a name and a product ID property, but I don't want those properties associated with any other vertices in my graph. And I'm also not requiring myself to have null values if I don't, for instance, have a product ID for a named product. You can also do the same thing with edges. I could say that it would be great if a customer could know another customer, but I want to ensure I'm never assigning a no edge between like a customer and a product. It's very easy to do out of the box with Janus Graph. And so fundamentally what you're doing is you're simplifying the way you test things, you're simplifying the separation of business logic versus more database tasks. And so finally, transactional analytical processing. Um, you know, when we think about navigating the data in a graph, we're really traversing it. And that just means we're moving from a vertex to another vertex by means of this connecting edge. And you know, if we think of a transactional workload, what that means is we're basically going to maybe one, two, or 10 vertices or edges. And so our goal is to really minimize latency. Um, on the other hand, if we're looking at an analytical workload, that's something where maybe we'll go to every vertex or every edge. A lot of like the classical graph algorithms tend to be analytical workloads. And so the goal there is obviously to maximize throughput. So if we think of like minimizing latency and maximizing throughput, that sounds a lot like what Scylla is kind of made to do. So Scylla you know, works very well as the back end for this sort of data system. And you know, their powers combined kind of gives us this nice package all in one. So all this, once again, is very good in theory, but how do we go about actually deploying it? So you know, first question, of course, is where do we deploy it? Uh, Scylla is pretty simple. We are probably going to deploy Scylla in the exact same way we would if it was just a regular Scylla cluster, so on VMs or bare metal. On the Janus Graph and Elasticsearch side, it really makes a lot of sense to deploy on Kubernetes. Uh, just a quick show of hands, like who's using Kubernetes today? That's actually a lot fewer than I thought. Um, so I think Kubernetes is, is a fantastic way to do these types of deployments. Um, it makes it much easier to manage. And you know, fundamentally, what is Kubernetes? We're just talking about an open source system that lets us manage containerized applications. Um, it basically lets us group you know, related application containers together into these logical units. And it's all about building abstractions on top of very basic resources. So instead of dealing with compute, uh, memory, disk, and network, we're dealing with like pods and services and deployments of multiple pods, which is much easier from like the application developer standpoint. So you know, to understand kind of how we actually deploy this data system, I am gonna dive a little bit into some of the, the lower level Kubernetes resources to make this stuff happen. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind when this gets like very in the weeds is that this is significantly easier to manage on Kubernetes than it would be if you were like SSHing into a VM and manually installing all of these dependencies and you'll run into conflicts and it's, it's a terrible place to be. So Kubernetes makes it much easier. And so what does that system look like when it's fully deployed? We basically have two sets of components. We have stateful and stateless. Stateful components are Scylla and Elasticsearch. And then stateless components are, are Janus Graph. You know, Janus Graph itself holds no data. It just acts as that nice abstraction layer that lets a, a client view their data as a graph. And so what that would look like would be we have a nice little uh, Scylla monster over here, issue a graph query to Janus Graph that will hit a load balancer, that will get passed to a pod that's managed as part of a Kubernetes deployment. And that pod which is running Janus Graph is gonna pass the queries it needs to, to both Elasticsearch for indexing and Scylla for all the primary data. And it will return back to the client this nice graph object. So diving into the more detail, Scylla, once again, we kind of can use our existing cluster. There's no real need to do any lift at all. The one thing we'll need to do is just set up a new clean key space for our Janus Graph data. Now Elasticsearch will deploy it on Kubernetes and you know, obviously I mentioned this is one of our stateful applications. So the best way of deploying this on, last, on Kubernetes is just with a headless service, a stateful set, and a storage class. And the goal of a stateful set, if you're, you're not familiar with this, is basically 
how do I maintain um, you know, reliable persistence if I know that my pods may live or may die? Because that's the whole you know, kind of guarantee Kubernetes gives us, that we'll be able to spin up a new pod if an old one dies. And so with a stateful set, we basically number each pod that's part of our deployment, and it will always ensure that the same disk will mount back to the same pod number in case that pod needs to be restarted for some reason. So it gives us very reliable persistence. It's all handled by Kubernetes. So manifests. Um, it's actually, this will not be as painful as it seems. Um, we'll start by defining a storage class. So, you know, I want some nice random access. We'll use some SSDs. We'll give it a name, Elasticsearch-SSD. We'll need to define our headless service, which basically just means setting our cluster IP to none and giving it a name, ES. Um, we can also define our Elasticsearch ports and then give it a selector for the pods that it will need to relay traffic to. And then the last step would be our stateful set itself. Uh, I tried to color code kind of the relevant segments of this. So everything in red relates to the headless service. Everything in blue relates to the storage class. So if we start with the storage class, uh, once again, our goal is to basically define these volumes that need to be mounted to individual pods. So we'll do that by referencing the storage class we just created, Elasticsearch SSD. We'll set its access mode to rewrite once, and then we'll give it a name. And then the last step is just mounting that named volume to the Elasticsearch uh, primary data path. The last step would just be uh, linking in the stateful set to the headless service. So we provide the service name, ES, and then we set one environment variable, which just allows, allows uh, no discovery while the cluster is booting up. Assuming we wrote all that to a single manifest file called elasticsearch.yaml, we can apply that with, with a single command. And then we just need to wait uh, a few minutes for our stuff to uh, go into a ready state. And then we'll see we have a stateful set. And we'll have the three pods it manages. And then we'll have our nice service underneath relaying traffic to the pods. So last but certainly not least is Janus Graph itself. Um, uh, an interesting issue that is less of an issue now is, you know, where do we get a Janus Graph image? So you used to kind of have to roll your own and it was a little more painful. Nowadays there's a official Janus Graph image available on Docker Hub. Um, I think a very reliable one is 0.4.0. But if you want to, you can still roll your own. You can use the Janus Graph project build scripts and just push that to any sort of private image repository you'd like. So how do we actually deploy it? Uh, I want to start with a minimal example that's not really for production use, but we'll get the point across of how you configure everything to talk to each other. And so let's say we just want to deploy Janus Graph as a single pod. So that's pretty straightforward to do. The idea is we'll deploy the pod and then connect to it with an interactive uh, terminal connection. And while our graph is only going to be accessible in that pod, we are still persisting all of our actions in Scylla and in Elasticsearch. And we basically do that by you know, setting up this manifest file again. We'll define our image. And then we set just four environment variables. So a nice thing about the, the standard Janus Graph Docker image is that there's a lot of templating and automation going on behind the scenes. So we can basically use this nice Janus props template environment variable and give it a value of CQL-ES, which would correspond to like a Scylla and Elasticsearch uh, storage and indexing backend combination. And from there, you really just have to supply three more things. Uh, you need the host name of one or more Scylla nodes. You need that clean Scylla key space that will hold our Janus Graph data. And then you just need the host names of our Elasticsearch nodes. So once, we, once we've done that, we'll go ahead and create that pod. We'll execute and, and launch an interactive terminal with that pod. What we'll have is a Gremlin console connection. So we see the cute little Gremlin pop up, and we're ready to go. Um, so as part of some additional Janus Graph image uh, automations, what we get is a nice populated Janus Graph.properties file, which will actually let us reference all those environment variables we set before. And with the Janus Graph factory, we're able to instantiate an instance of our graph. And that's now already talking to Scylla and Elasticsearch as we configured it to. Now we can do whatever we want. So for instance, we could start defining a schema. Um, in this case, we're defining a vertex called product, and we'll attach a few properties to it. But you can also write data, you can read data, anything you want to do. So obviously, like one user does not a data system make. You need to be able to handle multiple users, multiple different, multiple different client applications, probably written in different languages. So the best way to do that is use a, a server, right? So we'll deploy Janus Graph server 
um, using two simple pieces, a load balancer and a deployment. Fundamentally, under the hood, it's using uh, the Apache Tinkerpop Gremlin server, which is kind of what allows it to take these, uh, these Gremlin connections. Basically, it will accept Gremlin bytecode from any application that can write it. So you can think Python, Java, JavaScript, PHP, if that's your jam. Um, and it works really well. Service is very straightforward. It's just a load balancer with a selector for our app Janus Graph. And then the deployment is also very straightforward, much more straightforward than the stateful set. We need to define our app. We need to define the replicas. Let's say one, for instance. Uh, we'll define our image, and then we'll set the exact same environment variables we did in the pod scenario. Now, once we've done that, we can simply apply that manifest file and wait a few minutes for stuff to spring up. Once we have our service and our deployment ready to go, and once we have an external IP or an internal IP assigned to the service, we're ready to go, and it's ready to accept client connections. So, like dealing with all those manifest files is really painful, right? There's like a lot of details that kind of have to line up. There's a much better way, and that's Helm. So I'd highly recommend people use Helm. Um, you know, fundamentally, it's, you can think of it as a package manager for Kubernetes, which makes it very easy to just define, deploy, upgrade these, these applications that probably have multiple pieces. Um, Inharmonic did release an opinionated take on how you would deploy Janus Graph with Helm. Uh, it's just available on GitHub. You know, it's basically designed to work with Scylla and with Elasticsearch, as I just described here. So, you know, please let us know your comments. Hopefully, that will save you some time and energy getting going. And then just to recap, you know, with Kubernetes, what you end up having is a lot of power, and it makes it very easy to deploy Janus Graph on top of Scylla. And then once you have that thing deployed, you have this nice, flexible, scalable graph data system that allows you to build a very nice set of next generation applications. <laughs>